the pantheon of jazz, the two most potent tenor saxophonists to emerge from the cauldron of 50s bebop were John Coltrane and Sonny Rollins. Coltrane and Rollins fundamentally rearranged the sound of the tenor sax, as well as the role of the instrument in jazz itself. Throughout their careers, Train and Sonny kept expanding their range and broadening their horizons, musical and spiritual. Coltrane died in 1967, but Sonny Rollins remains a relentless musical explorer and remembers when they first met in the late 40s on a gig with Miles Davis. We played one job in the Audubon Ballroom in New York, and uh, he had another saxophone player there named John Coltrane. That was the first time that I played with Coltrane, and I met him, you know. And I think that must have been 1948 or 9. Saxophonist and educator Paul Jeffrey has been close to both Rollins and Coltrane since the 40s. Well, I remember one time, I don't know who was it, it was at the Cafe Bohemia. And Sonny and Train were playing with Miles. Now, I don't know whether Sonny, because Train was in the band. I don't know whether Sonny was in the band or he was just sitting in. And that was incredible. Sonny was playing this old con saxophone, and of course Train always played the Selma. Coltrane and saxophonist Jimmy Heath came up together in Philadelphia in the 40s, and once Heath moved to New York, he became quite close to Sonny. Well, I think they both had their own individuality, and they both were giants of this music. Train's style went through a lot of different changes, but I think the dimension of Train's sound stayed this pretty much the same. His sound, Sonny has changed his sound and the inflections. I think Train did it evolving harmonically and he set up problems that he solved and his music moved in that direction. Train had a harmonic sense and a linear sense that was different from Sonny. But Sonny has the beat of the music, the beat of life. And uh, they both have excellent uh, technique. I remember I used to go up to Train's house and he had the chords to Giant Steps, but he didn't have a melody. So for a year, just about, Train would practice on those chords. And of course, the things he did on But Not For Me when he changed the harmony. So I would say that, that Train was moving in that direction. Where Sonny, I don't think he ever really did it that way. There was always a friendship, a musical friendship, and uh, I think, and I, I think I'm safe to say that admiration, you know, because John was a very humble person, and he wouldn't, he was any, John wouldn't, he's not a person given to hyperbole and all this stuff, so he, if he says something, he means it, you know. One of the things about John that's, that's sort of different than other people. Anyway, so I know there was a mutual admiration. That came through the music. And then we became, you know, and I, I uh, appreciated that on a personal level. We, we remained friends and we'd go to see each other when, when we were playing. When he was playing at the Five Spot was around the corner. I used to bring him around to my house, was close to there. And then other times when he would visit. But I had a lot of, at that time I was trying to 
get myself together physically as well as mentally. Although they played many gigs together with Miles Davis, their only recording is Tenor Madness. John wasn't supposed to be on the date. He came out to this session like a lot of people did in those days. And uh, somebody's idea, hey man, why don't you guys play? Yeah, okay, so we made that session, that one song on the session, Tenor Madness. Sonny's not the type of person that is playing virtuos virtuosic challenges with other players. Just if you listen to the, the, the pairings with, like, say, Coleman Hawkins, he's not trying to outplay Hawk, and neither would John Coltrane. The trainer said that, said, well, Sonny was just fooling around. <laughs> When Lester Young was in the uh, Basie band, there was another very popular uh, saxophonist named Herschel Evans. And Herschel Evans had sort of a following, Lester Young had sort of a following. So again, you had this battle of the tenor stuff, you, you know, I mean, this is a tradition. And uh, Lester Young told me, so I was asking, we were talking about Herschel Evans one time, you know, and uh, Lester said, well, you know, Herschel loved his horn and I loved my horn. John knew I was serious about what I was doing. I knew he was serious about what. So that formed the basis of our relationship. As far as the battles goes, well, that's traditional. I didn't see any rivalry. The uh, media always tries to put one of us against the other. You know, we have this thing that one person is this and one is this, and only one at a time. You know, who's number one and who's number one, which is stupid. Because uh, when you look in a flower garden, there's a lot of beautiful flowers in the garden. Train was like a saint, and he was really, he was serious, he was sincere. And uh, when I first met John, the people, even the people around him down in Philadelphia, I'd meet people, they were all sort of, I mean, it was, he, he was a uh, special type of individual. I remember Train saying one thing, we were listening, a bunch of guys at Train's house, Central Park West on Third Street, and listening to Sonny. And here's what Train said, he says, Sonny can take any tune and play it like he wrote it. He says, I have to take tunes that I feel that are good for me to play. But he said, Sonny can take even the most obscure tune and play it like he wrote it. Which tenor plays do you think have influenced you, if any at all? I would say all of them. But, uh, Do you have a personal favorite? I mean, like you put on a record when you were at home and relaxing and so on. Well, Sonny Rollins is, uh, I think he's an outstanding to the man today. Yeah. And, uh, that is exactly usually... what Sonny Rollins <laughs> told me on this show about you. So that's, that's usually, <laughs> you know, my to be man. Our mutual you know. admiration society. Yeah, here. Well, he's, uh, he's, he's great. Maybe him and Monk were the two people that I consider really being closest to in the music business. I mean, maybe Miles a little bit, but Miles was always sort of a, um, you know, Miles had a lot of different things going, but just on the basis of sort of more ordinary people, I would say Mark and 
Coltrane were the guys that I felt most comfortable with to be able to be just whatever happened, happened. There's no, no surface stuff, nothing, just real life. We certainly shared the hope to get better and be better people. Train, Sonny, or myself, all of us still practice. Some well trained, wherever he's practicing, practicing is heavenly. <laughs> but uh, Sonny and I still practice. Uh, all the older guys, Benny Golson, all of us, we still practice. Because uh, nobody knows all of the music and nobody has a monopoly on it. So that's why we are in this field of music, creative uh, music, because it's so, such a wide open field. On that Coleman, uh, anybody will tell you, it's open sky. Mm -hmm.